Our speaker today is going to be our learned Dr. Brandstatter, Bernard Brandstatter, and it's going to be the part two of Contemporary Charismatic Christianity. That's what, that's what my email says. Believe it. <laughs> okay, and uh, so uh, you've been coming to our class from for for a very long time. About seventy-five years. Seventy-five years. Okay. Well, that's, <laughs> we'll we'll kind of let that go. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate Dr. Branstetter, and if you can come forward, we're going to let you um, speak. He has his fashionable hunting seat with him so uh, let me just have a word of prayer and uh, we'll let you begin uh, we thank you for this opportunity to be here today at the roy branson legacy sabbath school we pray that you'll be with dr branson in a special way continue to watch over him we pray in your name amen Thank you. Thank you. I see a few smiling faces, and the others are, are looking at me wonderingly to see what might come out today. As a matter of fact, uh, the title which was sent to you over the internet, Contemporary Charismatic Christianity, Christianity was uh, quite a mouthful and it's more than I expect to deal with thoroughly today and in fact it is one of the most difficult subjects for us to tackle together in this class now since we started meeting three or so years ago uh, we have uh, taken some satisfaction about being rather cerebral. We want to understand things. Yes, and uh, so we, we have colleagues whom we respect and, uh, and love, like Dr. Ston Tronstadt last week, who gave us a great study on the book of Romans, chapter 13, where he focused on one particular issue, and that is the the proper obligations of Christians to government. Was government given to us by God and therefore must we obey them? What do we do with the evil government? Anyway, that's the kind of issue that we have tackled. And uh, he did a, a wonderful job. I am delighted to know that the class is invited to by him and his wife Serena uh, to their home this evening and I don't know more than that about 6.30 or so this evening 6 o'clock 6 o'clock 6 o'clock mm -hmm. if you come after 6.30 you may be too late that's right uh, alright yes and uh, you can find their address it's somewhere in that well known town of Loma Linda and uh, it's all there on the internet not in my head I hope uh, most of you have received on coming in a copy of this handout that is a fitting introduction to what we have to say today. This is a quotation reproduced from the New Living Translation of the Bible and uh, the, the New King James Version excuse me and uh, it is the last ten or so verses of the book of Mark when Jesus is saying his farewells to his disciple and he is telling them what to expect and what their their task is as his representatives once he has left them so here we are I would like you all please would you read with me this is a a very important, I, re I believe. It sets the tone of what we're going to be talking about. 
Jesus predicted to his disciples some remarkable giftings they would receive. Here we go. Mary Magdalene sees the risen Lord. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been sent, seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. These appearances obviously are too much to be believed. They had seen him crucified. You don't, you don't wonder that they were disbelieving. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. We've read those verses many times. Have we taken them seriously? We somehow think that, that Jesus was talking, uh, hopefully, he was telling his disciples what to expect. Then, of course, the, uh, the book of Mark completes with this couple of verses. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Thank you, Lord. We read that in the book of Mark and we, we accept it. We just don't know how to interpret it in today's contemporary world. Are we seeing these, these predictions clearly and accurately fulfilled in our day? No. But if we, if we go back and trace the history of the Christian church, then we will see what we might call outbreaks of this miraculous uh, there's no other word for it this heaven endowed uh, capacity for for the power of God to be manifested through the disciples or as we call them later the apostles as they went all over the world preaching but those evidences are not being seen today or certainly not not in this class they are not. Uh, and isn't it fair to ask why not? Our Seventh-day Adventists today uh, fit to be called cessationists. That's a word simply means something stopped. And in fact, uh, through many centuries now, many voices in the Christian church worldwide, as far as it reached, were more or less dismissing or ignoring these predictions uh, recorded here in the Gospel of Mark and elsewhere as well, repeated in the Book of Acts. Uh, and it's a question that we still have to face today. Uh, these promises, promises that extend today, to today, or uh, should we be comfortable and uh, and simply accept the the attitude of cessationists, the 
the name Benjamin Warfield may be known to you. He was a great theologian in the early 20th century, 1910, 1915, 1920. Uh, uh, yeah, quite a defender of creationism, actually. But he was one who, who said that those signs that Jesus promised were to come to an end. The, that they were to cease. They were just intended for the immediate future when, uh, when the disciples would be preaching, going to all the world. And yet, uh, if we take time, which very few of us do, to look at the history of Christianity, we will find remarkable uh, examples of this sort of Christian endowment which seems queer to us but nevertheless in its own way it must represent some kind of fulfillment of Jesus' promise to his disciples. Uh, I should take time at the beginning of our talk this morning because although you have received uh, that quotation from the book of Mark there are other things here as well uh, in fact there are quotations here from the book by Mrs. White Ellen White Spiritual Gifts that was an early book which she published in the 1850s as a matter of fact quite early in her ministry but at that time, Seventh-day Adventists, the early ones, uh, were not all accepting her particular giftedness. And so she was obliged to defend what she now was convinced was a calling from God. And uh, the trouble was, Ellen White uh, wasn't a good person to defend her ministry because uh, it seemed as if she was just trying to promote herself. So it's interesting that uh, these quotes that I have reproduced in these handouts staple, in fact, to that quotation from Mark. Mm. Uh, here, Ellen White and her husband James White are defending very forcefully the legitimacy of the endowment which Ellen White was claiming to have. <clears throat> and here is uh, here are some words from page 19 in this rather untidy page here. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. In other words, uh, the scripture here uh, quoted by, by, by the whites were yes there is good but, but you don't it won't all be good there are, you hold fast what you test and find good but, but be on guard because there may be things that you should not hold fast to quench not the spirit we quench fire with water and prominent among the means of quenching the Spirit of God is unbelief. Jesus in his own country did not many mighty works because of their unbelief. Do you remember that, that verse in the book of, I think it's Matthew now, where Jesus, it says that Jesus went back to his hometown Nazareth, but he did not many mighty works there, and the reason was because of their unbelief. There are ways unbelief is a prominent one why the blessing of God might not be outpoured might not be seen again those who by unbelief quench the spirit in these last days this is Ellen White speaking will be prepared to sh will be prepared to share in the great blessings which God promises by the prophet Joel and quoted by Peter in Acts 2. All right. Uh, you are familiar with some of these quotations, but 
I thought we should remind ourselves here at the very outset today, we are not talking about something that is clear cut. We're not talking about the obligations of today's citizens to government, which has a yes or no kind of answer. We are dealing with the, um, the sometimes puzzling operation of the Holy Spirit. I uh, uh, have thought a lot about these issues for now many years and it's clear to me that there are two different ways in which the Holy Spirit operates in today's world and amongst ourselves. One way is the internal way where the Lord will either convict us, it will bring persons to uh, a sense of, of hunger for God, it can bring conviction, Yes, uh, and it can enlighten us if we, we can legitimately pray for a greater understanding when we're reading a puzzling text of Scripture. These are the internal uh, interventions of which we may be unaware. But they are nevertheless, to an, an extent which we may never know, they are the the operation of the Holy Spirit in our minds and hearts with one exception which I have to add here because I think God can illumine us, illumine us and, and give us greater understanding but he will not make decisions for us nor, nor uh, will he remove from us our freedom to make up our own minds and I one of the things that has become significant in my in my own personal convictions is that the freedom of the human mind and will to make decisions and be responsible for them is one of the most preciously guarded gifts that the Lord has given to us but nevertheless, he does somehow endow us with some giftedness of endowment or understanding uh, and leaves then the decision to us. All right. <clears throat> you know, I put aside a book here uh, be uh, just before I began this morning which I want to hold up and wave at you. If you haven't seen us, <laughs> this is a book by none other than the man who is <coughs> looking at me with a puzzling look on his face. is by William G. Johnson, our brother and friend up here, <laughs> and it's called Authentic Adventism. And uh, I had enough time last night to, uh, to at least become familiar with the, with the fields of understanding and faith which Bill Johnson, our colleague and friend, and uh, almost, I should say, a patriarch. He's been such a leader amongst Adventists for so many years. Uh, he speaks from a rich experience, and I have no doubt that the Lord has blessed Bill Johnson over many, many years in a in a mystery, ministry that has been covered. And I do encourage you to get a copy of Bill's book. It will bless you, and even as much as I could read last night, it was a blessing to me. He speaks from that rich background, and it's feet on the ground, faithfulness. Uh, and I think I, uh, I can guess that Bill Johnson will have some sympathy with the things I'm sharing with you this morning. <clears throat> it's a, and his sharing here, his vision of what the church should be today, uh, resonates very well with my own, my own sense of where this church, with all of its complexities, uh, where this should be heading today and how we can nudge it in that direction. Well, <coughs> uh, 
The other, the other introduction I need to give is, apart from this handout you received, I've got a row of things here that Forrest Howe is, uh, thank you Forrest, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> there are all kinds of, of extracts which I have selected from a variety of books and I have, have uh, copied them and uh, uh, not all of them will interest you. But the subject of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's functioning in charismatic Christianity is so complicated. We could spend a whole, a whole session here together speaking on one small aspect. I mean, the, one of the most puzzling and perplexing ones is the speaking in tongues which is puzzled Adventists and we have generally speaking rejected it but that can become a, a whole semester of study in college amongst uh, seminarians so you see uh, we have lots to cover and so I'm inviting you to look upon uh, this row of handouts here some of you may have not been here when I reported to you the, uh, the experiences in my early inquiries. I didn't understand anything about these issues. And so I, I uh, made available then this handout which is titled Charismatic Experiences with God. Are they real? Are they contrived? Are they delusionary? Or are they spirit blessed? We have to make up our minds. Now, uh, if you don't have a copy of this, there's a small pile of them here. Starting, as we might well do, from the early church fathers. Here uh, is a handout from a history book which tells us about the signs and wonders and miraculous ministries of some of the early apostles in the first couple of centuries. Justin Martyr was perhaps the first of them. Then came a man named Irenaeus. Peter will know all about these men. He's a Thank you. historical wellspring. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, if you read this handout, and this is just your, yours for the taking, if you want to inquire more, this will tell you a little bit about those early church fathers, the Anti-Nicene fathers, those were the church fathers that ministered before the Council of Nicaea. There we are. Now, uh, oh my, one of the earliest issues that arises when we talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the gift of healing. We are encouraged in several places and you know that well. I don't need, need even to, to quote the verses. One of the verses from Mark said that at the very end of that chapter. You, they will lay hands on people and they will be healed. Yes, and that promise also occurs in Joel chapter 2 and in Peter. So the gift of divine healing is prominent in the Bible. Here we are in Loma Linda University. How much prayer for divine healing are you aware? Or have we dismissed it as something that, that stopped when the disciples disappeared? That's a serious question. Serious question. Uh, I'm going to partly answer that question in a little while longer because there have been, in just recent years, examples of healing ministries which are mind-boggling. And I can assure you of that because I have been to interview the men who have been involved in this ministry. And uh, I did not know that what they were, what they were recording and reporting not in the uh, Review and Herald, I've got to say. No. <laughs> and, uh, and not on, on Hope Television. We don't really report 
why do not our Adventist media report uh, the truly surprising and uh, remarkable evidences of God's blessing that is not coming from our own church work. I suppose it's not in our backyard. It doesn't seem to be appropriate to give publicity, good publicity, God-blessed publicity, to the effects. I will share with you in a little while uh, something I learned about that and it staggered me. Uh, there is uh, another another chapter out of a book here which I would recommend that you read. It's a book out of a uh, a chapter out of a book by a man named John Wimber whose name may be not familiar to you but he was the founder of the Vineyard Movement and uh, I became acquainted with John Wimber because I had been perplexed and provoked by what had experienced to me in those early inquiries which I told about several weeks ago where I had been the recipient of a kind of a prophetic exhortation that was addressed to me by a man who had never seen me, didn't know anything about me. Uh, things of that kind which were this were strange and and puzzling and and troubling because I didn't know what to do with them. And you may recall that I I inquired of the the elderly Roy Allen Anderson, whom I used to call as Uncle Roy, and he gave me his counsel that time. Anyway, if you don't remember that or if you've, you don't have your copy, there is a copy down here for you. It's just titled Charismatic Experience with God. And uh, you can pick up on those things. Now, divine healing in the Adventist community. This is just not all by far, but it is perhaps uh, typical or uh, exemplary of divine intervention in human lives that we don't normally expect to be aware of. It's, it's far removed from us. That's what I believed until Bill Love, Pastor Bill Loveless provoked me once and told me to go and find out. <clears throat> I, was, I was puzzled and provoked by reference to divine healing by people like Oral Roberts, that name is familiar to some of you, but uh, there was one man that I used to see referred, referred to and reported on television that was far beyond Oral Roberts and I would like to to read this to you because I don't want to ramble I want to come right to the point and uh, this is titled and it's, there's a stack of this down here. It's titled, When God Does the Healing. Can we recognize it? Can we, can we attribute it logically and, and reasonably to the intervention by God? My subtitle is, Can We Believe Stories of Miracles in Africa? <clears throat> Let me repeat again. I'm sharing this with you because... It is an example of what millions of people, millions of Christian believers believe is the intervention by the Holy Spirit in human lives. These are serious words, my friends. I am not dealing with, uh, with trivial matters such as church governance and who is fit to be the president of our church or even to uh, to stand up and preach in church 
when God does the healing. In early 2008, I was intrigued by reports, if I may relax a little bit here. <clears throat> I was intrigued by reports in Christian magazines and the internet that told of huge crowds attending evangelistic crusades by a man called Reinhard Bonnke, a German preacher in Nigeria. It's a, crowd, it's a country of 150 million people and has big cities. The reports tell of over a million people at huge evening meetings. During some of his five-day campaigns, more than a million people have declared faith in Jesus. We're talking about a scale of evangelism and response that we have not ever heard of happening within the Adventist outreach. We have a different way of approaching uh, the gospel and and large congregations, large populations like this. What was it that drew these great crowds to listen to the preaching of a plain speaking, Bible quoting European like Bonke? The attention ca catching feature that stood out in the reports was the dramatic healing of physical ailments right there in the meetings and demonstrated on stage. It can be an exciting show when God shows up America has had some notorious healing evangelists, including AB, I'm sorry, Amy Semple McPherson, whose ministry morphed into the Four Square Church, Oral Roberts, Catherine Kuhlman, <coughs> but none of them matched the scale of success seen in Bonke's preaching. The crowds included different religious preferences, Christians and village spirit worshippers were there. But what impressed me was that many of those coming to a new faith in Bonke's meetings were from a Muslim background. Could this be true? In some other places, just one person coming from Islam to faith in Jesus is a major event that can stir up a family and upset a community. But Bonke was claiming that many Muslim believers had declared belief in Jesus at his meetings. But he was not a man to be easily dismissed. These are reports in major media. I was skeptical. It sounded exaggerated. I've heard evangelists big talk. But the reports were well written, not boast boastful. They sounded honest and believable. My attention was caught by the eyewitness descriptions of miraculous healings that excited the crowd. <coughs> there had even been a resurrection of a dead man. For a medical doctor, even one with a robust Christian faith, this was hard to swallow. Far away in California, steeped in Loma Linda's high science medicine, I considered the options. If these reports are true, it's either God or the devil or a bit of both. If only half of these reports are true, God must be in somehow. If faith means anything, we should not ignore these reports. We need to look more closely. If Bonke's preaching is honoring God and making unbelievers into genuine followers, an Adventist Christian should be willing to learn from what others are doing, though it's different from our familiar ways, here in Loma Linda anyway, We'd better take notice. Could I be comfortable with God showing up at Bonke's work? All my young life, I had believed the mission stories of answers to prayer, of angelic visitations, of illnesses healed, of God intervening to protect and bless his people. Some of those stories came from my own missionary uncles and aunts in remote Pacific Islands, my own trustworthy family, why not miracles amongst Africans? From reliable Adventist friends, I had heard reports of Imams and other village leaders in Africa and the Middle East receiving dreams which led them to seek truth about Easter, that's Jesus, from some Adventist source. If the Holy Spirit can protect missionaries in Fiji and give dreams to truth-seeking Muslims in Africa, why not healings 
in Nigeria. I wanted to judge for myself, to meet Bonke face to face and decide whether he is genuine or a fraud. The stakes are big, dear friends. So in early 2008, I was admitted to an invitational group meeting. I had to write an application and give them who I was and why I needed to come, and I was accepted by Bunky himself, who personally reviewed all the applications. He wanted a small group of trustworthy people hearing from him his own testimony. And he was having this meeting at his Florida headquarters. That's where his ministry called the Gospel to All Nations. That's where it's located. For two full days, 30 evangelists and Christian leaders from all over the world met close up with this extraordinary man, the most prolific evangelist in the world today. Uh, I haven't mentioned numbers, but Bonke reports that up till, up till the time I met him, over 50 million, over 50 million people who had been unbelievers were, were declaring faith in Jesus Christ at his meetings. Now friends, that number is unbelievable. I couldn't, couldn't stomach that. But that was his, what he was saying to us at this meeting where I was, I was a, an attendant. Over 50 million people and every one of these, uh, these collected cards were signed uh, and with an indication of their background and so on. During seven hours of lecturing, Bonke told us everything about his campaigns. His organization, his advertising, his preaching, his recording of decisions, his follow-up discipling. It's known as Christ for All Nations. It's a big operation, too big for me to describe in detail. Bonke's team were marvelous fellows. I met and talked with his two main associates. Now here I am. I've paid my own way. I've flown to Orlando in Florida. I needed to meet this man Bonke because he's claiming things that are right out of the book of Acts. I had to either decide he's a fraud or else there's something good happening here. And we, in Loma Linda, are ignoring it, you see. His two main associates, Peter Van Den Berg and Rob Birkbeck. Both of them I found to be dedicated men of action, committed totally to the central goal, winning people to Jesus. They are intimate with Bonke and trust totally his truthfulness and his spiritual leadership. Yet they are practical realists with a job to do. Months ahead of time, each at each new city, they would arrange meetings with governors and police, media interviews with publicity. They would hire a local work crew. And they have two huge truckloads of construction steel for platform and speaker towers for their mighty public address system, plus their own power generator and lighting system. This must all be set up in a large open space on the edge of town. It's far bigger than Ringling Brothers Circus. When you've got crowds of hundreds of thousands, even up to a million people, the average stadium cannot contain them. This was Bonke, and I am in, in this group of 30 men. Obviously, I'm the only Adventist there. I don't, I find it hard to defend the fact that I went, but I was provoked by what I was, I was reading. <clears throat> Then there's the training of thousands of local church volunteer counselors. Just listen to this as a, an example of how uh, a non-Adventist evangelist with a message to give, how he organizes things. And he's expecting a huge crowd and he has to have support from all the local churches. These people must mix with the crowd, pray with those who want to accept Jesus, and collect signed decision cards. New <coughs> believers must choose a particular church where they will report to be instructed and discipled. 
Bonke collaborates with many churches, but only if they preach the Bible from cover to cover, and if their pastor has a good reputation amongst local Christian leaders. No womanizing pastors, thank you. These preparations are all in the hands of Peter and Rob. They are pragmatic, hands-on men. They prepare the venue and leave the preaching to Bonke and the results to God. I don't know how this sounds to you, but I have never read of any, any uh, evangelism conducted anywhere in the world that compares with this in its, its, uh, in its size. What happens at meetings? The numbers Bonke gave us were beyond believing. They regularly see hundreds of thousands coming to evening meetings several times that had over a million at one evening meeting. Far too many for any stadium. Their PA system is said to be the most powerful of its kind in the world. Bonke's invitation to accept Jesus is clear and passionate and direct. Say yes to Jesus now. He, Bonke, may adopt African dress and have an animated platform style. He's meeting his audience at their level, as we do when we're talking to teenagers. The responses they see are marvelous. He told us that in 12 years of campaigning in Nigeria, his team has collected over 50 million decision cards, each one witnessed by a counselor and signed from people who declare they are giving their lives to Jesus. In a country of 150 million, 40 or million decisions for Christ is staggering. But photographs of the crowds convince me Bonke is giving the facts. They are far the biggest crowds I've seen anywhere in photographs. They show an ocean of faces and raised hands stretching far into the distance. Peter Vandenberg told me they've counted carefully. The numbers are not just a guess. They've developed a method to mark out the grounds into squares, count the density and estimate the crowd to within lim narrow limits. Especially impressive is that millions of those escaping Christ have been Muslims. They don't have to give up their Abrahamic belief in a sovereign almighty God. They can embrace Jesus as a divine savior prophet and enlargement and completion of their Islamic faith. How can we know the numbers? Muslim names on the cards can, can't, oh, can help, but it's known that the demography of Nigeria is being radically changed. Forrest, you are giving me signals. Time's up. For question and answer. We are devoting one week from today a full hour to questions and answers. So, uh, okay. So yes, I'm... That is fine. I did not realize that. No. Well, uh, you see, uh, David Larson has the gift of foreknowledge. So, <laughs> so he, he predicted that there would be need for time for question and answer. And uh, no, you're right. And if there are no questions here, I will be mightily surprised. I was surprised, and I was unbelieving when I first heard Bonke's reports of the sheer scale of his, of his evangelism. Over 50 million people accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. All right. Years ago, Nigerian people were evenly split 50-50 between Christians and Muslims. But the mix is changing. Experts have told Bonke they believe the proportions are now 70-30 and some suspect the true numbers are closest to 20 or 80-20. This nation is being transformed. I tried to find confirmation of this. It wasn't easy because the authorities in Nigeria don't want to talk about it. I searched the website of the Nigeria Population Commission and I learned that in 2006, when the religion shift became obvious, the government wanted to avoid angry demonstration in Muslim areas, so they removed from census records any questions about religion. They don't want to stir up animosity and strife. 
devout Muslims can feel threatened and get angry and violent. You've no doubt heard about the Boko Haram in Nigeria. But the whole nation is being changed. So it's working. What exactly does Bonki preach? I've taken the time to read this, friends, because it gives you an example of, of extraordinary ways of reaching out to the non-Christian population in some continents. It's not just in Africa, although there are many other countries in Africa where Bonki has ministered. It's in South America as well, where Christianity has been transformed in the last 30 or so years. It's certainly true in Asia anyway. Let me, I want to finish this and then we will, we will close for today. And uh, you will have the chance to come and, and uh, pick what you like from these handouts here that may answer some of your questions. What is Bonke's content? No hesitancy from him. Bonke insisted he has no gimmicks, no tricks. He preaches a straight gospel of sin and salvation. Sin in Nigeria is like sin anywhere. Hurting your neighbor, telling lies, dinner, dishonesty and greed, hatred towards anyone, spiteful, angry attitudes, stealing, failure to pray and worship, neglect of spouse and children, too much time with sport and television, bad language, there's need for repentance. Can you imagine Bonke reciting these, these failures to a crowd of Africans who were non-Christian? Non Jesus loves and died for us. Salvation and hope of paradise is a gift of grace through faith. You have to make a serious, no-nonsense choice and stick with it. That was what Bonke said he presents when he preaches to these vast audiences. Hey? I judge for you. I'm re reciting here in this paper, and these copies are over there. I'm just reciting to you what I heard from him face to face. But there's something more. Beyond forgiveness, Jesus promised a gift called the Holy Spirit to make us new people, change our lives. He may even heal our sicknesses. At the meetings, new converts pray for forgiveness and salvation with the counselors. But with Bonke, they pray for the Holy Spirit to bless them. The Holy Spirit is more powerful than the village ancestral priests, spirits. Nobody doubts the village priests' supernatural powers. All those Africans have seen the village priests at work. But Bonke insists Jesus is more powerful and they can't have both. If they want Jesus, they must reject the demonic power of the village priest. They must bring their charms and amulets to tomorrow night's meeting here and destroy them in a bonfire. Do you see what, what Bonke's mission is? Sick people do get healed at Bonke's meetings. Village, city, city and village people see it and believe. After hearing the accounts firsthand, I eventually gave up my stubborn skepticism. Believe my friends, I'm a Loma Linda medical professor. Uh, I found it very hard to swallow all that I was hearing, except that he was a man of God, speaking from a very rich experience. Some stories were questionable, some others were beyond fabrication. Healed people would come to the big platform, waving in the air their crutches, or a wheelchair, and on the microphone they would tell the crowd what happened to them. Here at this meeting, of course the crowd would get excited and shout hallelujahs, or what is the African equivalent? Christians, Muslims, all of them. And the whole huge crowd had the feeling that, hey, we're seeing it, God is here. Seeing is believing. When you see it for yourself, one miracle can make anyone a believer. I was sued, this is Bernard Brandstater now, I was sued on first name terms with Bonke 
we were Reinhard and Bunke and, and Bernard. I was given the privilege of having lunch with him one on one over a small table with an hour and a half during which I was free to ask him every question I wished to ask him about his ministry and about his miracles all the rest. There was plenty of time to ask questions and I quickly got down to business. He was open and direct and self-deprecating. He had no explanation for the healing miracles except they were not his doing. He had no such power. He prays for the Holy Spirit to come and miracles just happen. Many sorts of healings. They have become such a famous feature of his campaigns that he now, that is Bonky now, has a strong faith and a confident expectation they will having happen in his campaigns. They must be gracious acts of a merciful, powerful God. Does Bonky verify these healings? I asked him. Do you go and make sure? Or are these just stories that people tell? To check their genuineness. Not often, he told me, because that means wasting time and effort when no one at the meeting and no one in that family has any doubts. Reports come not from a single healed person, but from the whole family and often a crowd of village neighbors. If a deaf, deaf person can suddenly hear, all of the neighbors know that happened. He prays, oh, a recent book he reported on the web that three children in the same family were all blind for some reason at cataracts. I don't know what it was. And they were known by everyone in the village. They were blind. They had to be helped. But at the meeting, in Bonke's meetings, all three of them received sight at an evening meeting. Wait a minute. And Bonke told me that he did send one of his associates to that village to verify to see whether that was believable or not. And that, that, that emissary that went to the village to check, he found it was true. Every person in the village knew that these three blind children had received sight. So I was hearing this. Was Bonky just telling me falsehoods? He was a man of God, and uh, that's his own spiritual journey is something else. What about the resurrection that had been claimed? A resurrection from the dead. I probed Bonky about that over lunch. The dead man had been severely injured in a car accident. He had died while being taken to a doctor's clinic and his body was taken to a mortuary. But after three days in the mortuary, that man came back to life. I'm sorry, friends, you don't believe this, and neither did I when I first heard it. I challenged Bonky. My medical colleagues in Loma Linda would never believe it. I can't tell them. Friends, this is the first time today that I have been bold enough in a group whose common sense and uh, and Christianity I trust. And I'm just reporting to you really what I've heard myself from a source that I had come now to believe. My, my colleagues in Irma Linda would never believe it. I assured Bonky that a head concussion can cause coma that looks like death. But when the brain swelling subsides, the victim can regain consciousness and it looks like a, re a resurrection. But Bonky shook his head. The man was dead for two days, and the experienced mortuary staff know life from death. <coughs> but I said to Monkey, but it's possible for a coma to last even three days, and then consciousness can return surprisingly. But Bonkey corrected me. It wasn't like that, he said. He himself, Bonkey, had questioned the mortuary boss about the sequence of events. In protest, the boss told him he had already embalmed the man. To that, today, 
to the day I was, had lunch with Bonky, that man was back with his family pastoring a small village church. That man has become famous in Nigeria and his own dramatic story <coughs> is widely believed in that country. With that sort of story in the national media, Bonky is a well-known name in Nigeria. No wonder people come out to his meetings. Now, the time has, has come and you can see why I have, let me admit it, I had been to see Bunky after meeting with and being challenged by the witness of people who, who to me came across as people whose testimony I could believe. But friends, I have not until this morning had the courage to share this account and these witness reports with a group of Adventist believers from University Church. And you can wonder why, because I don't expect you to be any less skeptical than I was. And I'm only an hour reporter, but there will be plenty of time, I hope, next week. There are reports from other persons that I would like to share with you because that brings it right down to our local area here and people whose personal testimony uh, you have to judge for yourself. I'm only a reporter. I'm telling you what I've heard from people, but they are people whose, whose faithfulness and whose own personal spiritual experience is beyond me. And so I'll leave it to you. And Forrest Howe is here. I, I know that we will pray from the green sheet in a moment, but I cannot stop my recitation this morning without my prayer for God's guidance and instruction. For all these years I have kept these things to myself because they were so troubling. I didn't expect gatherings of, of my fellow church members would be easily persuaded. I'm not even persuaded today. But I offered to David that I would report what is this charismatic stuff all about? And I would like to close with my prayer and then we will have you all join in the benediction. Lord, I've been with these good people several years now and we have been seeking you in many ways and seeking understanding, sometimes about matters which puzzle us and we don't understand them. And so Lord, it's one of those things that I have been sharing today. And you know the, the uncertainties and qualms which, which these reports that have come to me have, have provoked and troubled me and, and they must be puzzling and perhaps, perhaps troubling others this morning. Lord, all I know is that we need the Holy Spirit to guide us to enlighten us and help us to believe what is your believable word. And Lord, we just want to do your will and follow you as far as you lead us and as long as we live. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you, doctor. And uh, at this time, we'll have our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I'm inviting you here and now to be willing to share with the rest of the group any extraordinary experience that has puzzled and perplexed you. And it'll be your turn next week. Thank you.